and I want to welcome our panel to the stage. Um, so folks can come up, and I think everyone's got their name. And moderating the group, and I, I really want to thank Lydia DePillis from the Washington Post. Um, she covers a range of issues, business policy, trade, urban affairs, and infrastructure. Um, she did cover technology at the New Republic and wrote some really excellent pieces early on about the rise of innovation districts. Um, and then she also covered land use. So she's the perfect moderator for this panel on innovation districts. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, packed house. It's so exciting. This is such a sexy topic. Um, and a uh, great presentation from Bruce. And you have these shining reports to look over them at your leisure. Um, we have a really excellent panel today of people who were instrumental in a lot of the projects that Bruce went over. So I'm excited to be able to get a little bit more in depth with all of them. Um, to my left, we have John Fry, president of Drexel University um, and has uh, also headed up Franklin and Marshall University and um, been an executive vice president at Penn, so very familiar with Philadelphia and um, has been really important in the innovation district surrounding um, that university and I'm, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Promise Neighborhood Initiative that they're also working on. Um, I'll keep these brief because I think they're you know all in your, um, programs and or at least online and we want to get to, to talking. Um, then we have Nicole Fischera who is the general manager of the Boston Innovation um, District building which houses a bunch of startups and is a great civic space that um, lots of people can use in the seaport district of Boston which is not um, <laughs> close, it, it's uh, not the place that you usually think of in and around Boston for innovation, but has turned into one. Um, to her left, we have Kofi Bonner, who's uh, president of Lennar Urban Communities in San Francisco, um, and has held a number of different positions in and around the Bay, working for government, um, and is, was involved in projects that are really important in San Francisco, if you've been there, um, from the Yerba Buena Gardens. Uh, to um, the, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the last one, I, but um, a bunch of other sort of important spaces uh, that we now think of as pretty in, integral to, to that landscape, which is pretty much the foremost um, place for, for startups now in America. And then and finally we have Julie Wagner, who um, is behind a lot of Bruce's work and is uh, now in uh, based in Zurich uh, and has worked with the European Commission there and is um, looking very in depth at uh, um, a bunch of cities um, in, in Europe specifically, so she'll be able to give us uh, a good understanding of how they do it on that side of the Atlantic. Um, so let's just get into it. Um, Mr. Fry, President Fry, um, I think that the question of how innovation districts can help their, the neighborhoods in which they live is really important because um, we read a lot, for example, in San Francisco about the inequities inherent to technology development. Um, there's a lot of people who are left out of that form of economic progress. And so why is the Promise Neighborhood so important to you? Um, and you know, why did Drexel decide to get involved? It's not something that everybody necessarily takes on. And also, feel free to tell us more about. Sure. Well, let, let me let me frame up what our innovation neighborhood looks like, which is what we're talking about. So, in University City, and just to give you the geography, if you come out of 30th Street Station and you're heading west, um, it's from 30th Street Station to 38th Street to the south, um, University Avenue, where Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania all the way to the North Market and JFK. So it's a pretty big area. In that area are the campuses of Children's Hospital, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Presbyterian Hospital, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania Health System, the University City Science Center, which Bruce showed you before uh, on the map, which is on um, Market and about 34th, the University of the Sciences, which is a little bit further west, and of course, Drexel University. So we're talking about an enormous aggregation of intellectual and, and physical and, and financial assets which heretofore have been a bit disconnected. And so I think the, the idea behind our innovation neighborhood 
um, has sort of two parts. One, can we create an aggregation point around 30th Street Station? And as luck would have it, and I'm not sure why exactly this happened, but we've been able to acquire about a little over 12 acres of uh, property right adjacent to 30th Street Station, pretty much out to 32nd, Chestnut to the south, JFK Boulevard to the north. That's about six and a half million feet of potential development right around the third busiest train station in the fifth largest city in the country. So that's, that's a good piece of, of geography to be um, responsible for. Um, and then secondly, to the, the north of, of 30th Street Station is about a 75 acre rail yard, which we think has the potential for all sorts of uh, development using air rides and using the existing ground. Immediately adjacent to that rail yard is Mantua, which is probably the third most um, economically distressed neighborhood in, in Philadelphia. So we're looking at this sort of holistically. What can we do to create this innovation district in the way in which Bruce has, has described it in University City and at the same time be completely in service to the revitalization of very distressed neighborhoods like Mantua? And we're lucky enough now to have the Promise Zone designation one of five in the country. So we're trying to think about this holistically, not just an innovation district over here and a distressed neighborhood over there, but something that, that encompasses all of that. And I think within the neighborhood, if you take a look particularly at uh, the possibilities of doing um, a K through eight STEM-based public school, which is what we're working on right now, improving housing, improving commercial corridors, enhancing um, the quality of, of life through things like public safety and, and retail corridors, we have a chance in Mantua, I think, to do something very significant while we do our work in this innovation district. And if we get it right, everything will be you know, done in an integrated way, not do an innovation district over here and forget the neighborhood over there. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, and um, important to mention, if people are not familiar, Promise neighborhoods do come out of uh, housing and urban development grants. Um, so it's a partnership with the federal government that involves lots of investments in um, neighborhoods from health to education to housing. Um, Nicole, so tell us a little bit about um, how the Boston Innovation District got started, whose idea was it, and how do you know that it's working? Sure. Yeah. So um, I, I should also say that I, I now run District Hall, which is yeah. the uh, public innovation center. It's sort mm -hmm. of right at the heart of things in the Innovation right. District. But I also worked for Mayor Menino mm -hmm. uh, as the manager of the Innovation District Initiative and um, uh, really started working on this um, project in, in 2010, which is when the Innovation District was first announced at the beginning of Mayor Menino's last turn. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting to see it in the framework of all of these kind of taxonomies and, and of innovation districts all over the world and, and also the uh, kind of strategic forethought and planning that's going into some of the innovation districts that are, that are um, uh, getting started because we didn't, we didn't have that. You know, in, in Boston in 2010, um, there wasn't really a roadmap and, and um, well, it gets way louder if I go this way. Uh, sorry, guys. I'll, I'll try to stay right in the middle. Um, <laughs> but we, did, we didn't have that. And you know, Bruce uh, uh, said it was an iterative approach, and I think that that's really true. You know, what we had was um, a thousand acres on the waterfront of uh, former rail yards, for post-industrial waterfront land, um, underutilized, had had some fits and starts on development uh, many, many times, um, and uh, it was a colossal opportunity because it was so well located. It's right next to South Station, which connects to Harvard, connects to Cambridge, connects down into the neighborhoods in Dorchester um, and to Quincy now, which has a lot of activity going on, right next to um, uh, the airport, Silver Line to the airport, connects um, the, the South Boston waterfront out to Logan Airport in about 10 minutes on public transit. Um, and had recently really been opened up by these massive public infrastructure projects like the Greenway uh, and the Boston Harbor cleanup that, that reconnected Boston and its downtown to its waterfront. So it was sort of too big of an opportunity to waste. Mm -hmm. and, and the driving thought behind um, using that geography for the Innovation District was if we have this much opportunity, a thousand acres this well located, we have to do something here that positions it for the future of the economy. It can't be anywhere USA. It can't be like another luxury mixed use waterfront um, that's not inclusive, that's not really positioning Boston uh, to be as resilient as possible in the face of, of future economic downturns. Of course, we were coming right out of it in the middle of the recession when this all started. So what we had was, was that, this, this sort of um, opportunity and a mandate to do something better than before. And then um, 
uh, we kind of had three key principles that really brought us through the whole thing, and that was first the idea of an urban lab, a place where we could test new ideas. Um, second, this idea of sustainable leadership, that, that sustainability had to be core to the innovation district, not just in terms of kind of building materials, but also in terms of uh, economic resiliency and sustainability, and it's sort of writ larger. Um, and then the third thing is this idea of the shared innovation, this, this idea of inclusiveness, and that we should um, be, be making it as op open and permeable as possible for people that don't normally participate in the innovation economy. And I think, um, you know, if, if I could talk about nothing else, I think I would talk uh, about the rethinking of the public realm ground plane um, in cities. Like, what do you do with your first floor? It's not just about retail, right? It's, it, if you're looking at the Innovation District in Boston, what we've really tried to do is take our lobbies and our, in our housing, um, residential buildings in our hotels, and District Hall, certainly, which is, is a one-of-a-kind building. I'd love to talk more about that um, uh, in particular, but it, it's this idea that on the ground floor, you could have a permeability that people could just walk in to a building that would formally, as Bruce was describing, be so locked down, right? These, this is all about like IP and being closed. Um, but why not kind of ask these public realm spaces to do more for our economy, to become places where people can connect with each other, um, where, where a startup that's running out of conference room space in their office because they're hiring like crazy might get a little more elbow room because they have some place uh, right around the corner where they, they could sit and work for a couple of hours. So um, that's really how we thought about it in Boston is, is adhering to those kind of principles, the, the urban lab, sustainable leadership, the shared innovation, and then and really taking this real estate approach where, where the ground floor becomes something that it hasn't been in the past. And, and I think that um, is probably what I'm the most excited about. I think that has so a lot of legs for the future and for other projects. Um, just give us a little bit more idea of an idea of how the district hall works. Can I just walk in and set up a company or? Yeah, so District Hall, is, it's, we're not an incubator. I'll tell you a lot of things that we're not. We're not an incubator, we're not a co-working space, we're not an accelerator. We're really a gathering place for the innovation economy. So it's 12,000 square feet um, of just civic space, of a, a kind of living room for the innovation district uh, where people can come in and work for a few hours next to our coffee shop, um, hold a meeting, investors hold office hours there. Uh, but we also have event space. So we have a you know, theater space where we can have everything. Uh, we've had everything from multi-day you know, off-sites for clean tech companies and conferences on uh, urban policy and innovation to lunchtime dance parties for entrepreneurs. Um, and we have uh, conference rooms that can be rented for, for different things. So it's, it's really meant as a gathering place. We have a, quite a lot of co-working spaces and office spaces that give people a permanent place to call home. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's a place to kind of strengthen strong ties and, uh, and work on that kind of weak ties network that, that Bruce is really talking about. Um, and how can we bring those two together so we're, we're building trust face to face as people connect with each other, see each other over and over again. And, and you sort of understand that, yes, there really is a community here that we can connect into. Uh, does it pay for itself or does the city just... Some no, it's actually, yeah. it's privately funded and built. Uh, so it's a public, I would say it's a public-private partnership with a triple capital P. It was a, 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 a public vision from the mayor's office to have this gathering place for the Innovation District. Um, it was privately funded and built by Boston Global Investors as part of their 23-acre Seaport Square development, um, really as a community benefit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a part of their larger master plan. And then uh, it's actually run by um, uh, the Venture Cafe Foundation, which is the not-for-profit sort of sister organization to the Cambridge Innovation Center, which we've heard about today also. Um, so it, it's really this kind of public vision, private funding, um, and private operation that, that really keeps it going. But it, it's, a, it's a civic space. Um, we have sponsors. We're, we're a nonprofit space as well. So it's a combination of sort of event revenue uh, along with uh, sponsorship revenues that, that really keep us going. And, and we, I mean, we've been open for, you know, uh, eight months or something now. So check back with us in a year. And <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Kofi. That's great. So your yeah. current baby is Hunter's Point Shipyard, um, which is Tell us how big that is, what it means, um, where it is in San Francisco, and, and how it fits into some of the concerns we see with um, you know, the tech economy, um, perhaps driving a little bit of um, inequality and uh, just a in really inflated housing sure. bubble in San sure. Francisco. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, Nicole, don't be surprised if I steal the idea of District Hall <laughs> yeah, and recreate it in the first shipyard. One. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fabulous. <laughs> You're doing a great job there. So uh, yes, I am working uh, in San Francisco in a, in a fabulous property. It's 800 acres. 
800 acres, about uh, 15 minutes from the financial center of downtown, and 10 minutes from the airport. It's in the southeastern part of the city, and right look, in the, on the edge of the Hunters Point Bayview uh, community. And to any of you that may know San Francisco, you would know that the Bayview Hunters Point community is a fabulously proud and uh, historic community. Uh, but it is also the area that has a significant amount of underemployment and unemployment. And so we, we work very closely with the community there. So 800 acres, uh, the property was formerly a naval shipyard, a decommissioned naval shipyard. The property uh, also includes the former home now of the San Francisco 49ers as they're moving down the street to Santa Clara. And the property also in, in, in entails uh, uh, about a 300 home uh, community that's a public housing development. So uh, we are working with uh, some fairly interesting properties uh, in that portion of town. What we're working on directly, we've started construction, is uh, building 12,500 homes, a variety of uh, product types from uh, walk-up apartments, uh, uh, townhomes to high rises. We also will be building about 800,000 square feet of not just regional serving retail, but also neighborhood amenities. And of course, we'll be providing another three and a half million square feet of office and commercial space and R&D space in San Francisco. Uh, all these properties are uh, linked uh, with uh, fiber, of course. They're all linked by 300 acres of waterfront park, and they're also linked by a bus rapid transit system. Uh, I think perhaps what's most interesting and most pertinent perhaps to today's conversation is those things that we're very purposefully doing, we're uh, working with the mayor's office and the Chamber of Commerce to really introduce some key components that we think are critical to the future sustainable uh, development of this uh, property. There's no question, as you mentioned, Nicole, that uh, there are a number of very large developments that in and of themselves are livable, they're green, we'll uh, lead ND gold, and they will essentially be sustainable. But I think the critical piece here is we're going out and looking for very specific components to bring to this community. Uh, we're working with a major university in town to bring their STEM campus on, on the ground. Uh, uh, and uh, we would hope that over the next six months we'll be able to initiate the planning and programming for about 300,000 square feet of, as I say, a STEM campus there. And that in the conversations so far has been quite exciting. There's a notion of introducing a high school uh, uh, adjacent to that uh, education, uh, university piece to also uh, bring uh, some talented uh, high school folks into, onto the property. We're also uh, working very closely with uh, some potential uh, technology uh, companies that are currently located in San Francisco, but unfortunately are feeling some of the pressures from the uh, fairly significant growth in the tech industry there. It's no secret that uh, San Francisco has become a, a fabulous uh, tech hub over the last few years, and more recently, many of the Silicon com uh, Valley companies are beginning to move their offices into San Francisco, further exacerbating some of the pressures in the commercial space. So we have the opportunity to really work with some of those companies that perhaps haven't yet matured to the, uh, let's say, the, the Cisco's and the Google's, et cetera, but are really doing innovative work in the city. And that we're working with the Chamber of Commerce and, and the uh, mayor's office to retain those companies and have them grow and thrive within, within the city, and we'd like to create those spaces. We recently uh, received approval for an artist studio. There are currently 300 artists working in the shipyard. Well, we just think that creative energy uh, should be retained as part of our overall development. So we've created and, uh, and received approvals for a new artist studio. And we'll obviously work very closely with the artists to bring that energy and sort of the hipness, if you will, mm -hmm. to the shipyard. So uh, we think these key components, in addition to uh, sort of more the mundane redevelop uh, redevelopment and uh, community development uh, type features that are already embedded in the plan, will only, uh, again, make sure that we add value not only to the adjacent communities, but also to the city, and obvi obviously to our bottom line too. And I will add that uh, as part of our um, relationship with the community, 
We're working very, very closely with uh, a number of key nonprofits within the community and a citizens advisory commission that is located in the city. And we provide a significant amount of funding and opportunity to not only provide funding for a variety of very important social needs, but we also have local hire requirements and job training uh, uh, facilities that we hope will enable the folks working through the unions to trans uh, transition onto our properties and ultimately, frankly, not only work on our properties and gain a f you know, really s sustainable wages, but ultimately to, to live on the properties and, 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 and grow their families right there within the neighborhood uh, in which they were born. So we're quite excited by the opportunities. It's such a cool opportunity to be able to work with that amount of space. And I should also mention that um, Kofi worked on the Mission Bay, which is another giant, rapidly developing space um, on the waterfront. Um, Julie has come to us from Europe, um, where she's worked in, in depth in a bunch of cities. And so what are they doing that we're not? What can we learn from them? Anything? Or is it, is it all one way transaction? Oh, no, it's definitely mm -hmm. two-way. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> um, they're learning as much from us as, as, as frankly, as we can learn from them. Um, so Europe has a number of innovation districts, and they are highly distinctive from one another, which is fascinating learning experience in and of itself. Part of the reason for their variation is their distinctiveness and their regional economies and their country economies, frankly. So in traveling across different countries, the story of their innovation is radically different and equally fascinating. So let me start with Barcelona, because um, mm. It really was the place that caught our eye. It was the first place where we saw this new geography of innovation. It's, um, it very much conforms to one of the models that Bruce outlined in the presentation, the reimagined urban areas model. And essentially what happened there is that in the 1990s, um, under the new leadership of a mayor, Yonkos, basically established that there was a need to grow knowledge and innovation clusters. That Barcelona, as well as the rest of Spain, frankly, was lagging on a number of these um, economic clusters compared to their Western European counterparts. So they set their eyes on focusing how can we channel our resources in a discrete area, and they chose a post-industrial um, area that was vacant, abandoned, neglected in, along the waterfront, and they coined this 22 at Barcelona. And the work that they did there honestly was fascinating. I mean, the, the level of vision and intentionality to redo the physical landscape in terms of um, decking, as Bruce mentioned, decking the railways, creating new infrastructure um, such as the tram, making it pedestrian oriented and walkable, making it enticing, building new housing, 400 housing units. Uh, revamping the existing housing units, figuring out which of the historical industrial spaces should we save and, his and protect, and which should we let go of. Um, the list goes on and on and on in terms of the physical changes that they made to make this space exciting, vibrant, attractive. Now, the part that actually I found the most interesting is not the physical, even though the amount of time and resources they devoted to that, but was their ec economic uh, focus, their economy shaping strategies. And what they basically did, and if I can just put this in a nutshell, is they tried to create economic magnets. And they saw economic magnets as having several components. That we need universities, so they lured universities. We need large companies, they lured large companies. We need medium companies, they lured those too. And then, as in addition to that, we need to build um, incubators. They built those. And we need to create the kinds of programs and services that would entice and basically create this gravitational pull for other firms to come to 22 at and then to grow existing firms. And this is exactly what they did. So in the early 1990s, there was very little economic activity in this area. Today, there's over 7,000 firms. And over 2,000 of those firms were created at 22 at. This is, equates to about 84,000 jobs that they now have in 22 at Barcelona. So even in the midst when Spain was having real economic challenges, I would always call them up. How are you doing now? How are you doing now? And they sustained, if not grew. 
And so it's an interesting, you know, in the midst of the Great Recession, in the midst of what they were struggling with, they still found reasons to, to, to sustain. So that's one example of a reimagined urban areas. There's two others that I just want to quickly highlight. One is in London. It's called Tech City. It's in the, one of, in the East London neighborhoods. Um, and their focus is on the digital economy. And um, it's, what's interesting about that is that there had been a lot of press about this tech city. What is it? Is it hype? What's going on? You know, is the ICT tech sector, is it really moving forward? Is this just an idea? So they actually had commissioned a think tank to do some real detailed quantitative diagnostic. And they found, yes, there is some real significant movement in the economy in this sector all clustered within these neighborhoods, supported by, real, by neighborhood serving amenities, and it's growing. So they found in 2010, they found over 3,000 firms and are providing 48,000 jobs. East Berlin, another example, a burgeoning tech sector. The area is sort of has this gritty, interesting mix that just is drawing a lot of entrepreneurs, not just from, from Germany, but from other parts of Europe. And so this is one that we're watching. Um, they've recently initiated a number of networking opportunities that are listed on websites, where you're basically trying to teach and train and connect people, very similar to what's happening in Boston. Um, and so there's really growing excitement there, and I look forward to watching that one. The last one that I want to focus on is Stockholm. There's two innovation districts there, one focusing on ICT. The other one is focusing on life sciences right in the heart of the city and is built on a platform of four very strong academic research uh, universities focusing on life sciences. And so they came together along with the city and a number of the companies there and said, we can do more. We can do more even though Sweden is off the charts on, in, on innovation indicators. We can still do more. And so they put together this Vision 2025 plan that Bruce highlighted, and they're going to be building thousands of housing units, new lab spaces, offices. You know, you know the, the drill of all the different types of things they're going to be adding to their portfolio. They're ultimately aiming to see about 25,000 additional jobs just in life sciences. So if you multiply it by, by five, we have a good number. So it has been a fascinating journey, personally and professionally, to see how these places are growing, how they're thriving. It's been a petri dish of learning, and um, it's been a pleasure writing about it. Awesome. Thank you all for telling us about your particular projects. And the first question I'll throw out um, to the panel um, is this question of, of competition, because if everyone does what Bruce says, they're going to start innovation districts in their own cities, and theoretically, there's only a finite number of research dollars and talent and venture capital funding, and we all know how cities compete against each other generally for big companies. So is this a zero-sum game? Um, can you all, or and do you all currently think about um, how you can get a talented person or startup company from going to your project rather than somebody else's. Yeah, um, maybe I'll grab this it's, one. So I, you know, I think when I first started working on this stuff, this innovation district stuff, there, there were much more um, questions about you know Boston versus Cambridge and like all of this stuff, and and um, and it was it was a more sort of you know feather in your cap approach of like, we've got X company to move here, like go us. Um, I think that that uh, the conversation has really matured since then. I think it's it's evolved in the last few years. And, and that the uh, approach now for innovation districts is, I'd say definitely it's not a zero sum game. I think what it's about is asking our cities, our physical spaces, uh, the existing economic assets that we have um, and, and other ones that we can grow, how can we ask these things to work harder for us? Um, you know, I always, I, my background's in architecture, so I, I can't help but look at things from that lens. But, um, you know, that spaces should really work harder for us and for our economy. Um, uh, that, that with the amount of time, the amount of capital investment, uh, the amount of energy that goes into making something physical, whether it's a building, 
um, or a piece of transit infrastructure, or, or, or even just to like a build out in an office, right? I mean, these things all cost a ton of money and a ton of energy that we have to ask more from them. We have to say, not only are you kind of keeping us dry overhead and stuff and all the things that our buildings are supposed to do, but are, are you helping me connect with the ideas that I need? Are you helping me connect uh, with the resources that I need? Um, are, are, are cities part of the toolbox that can grow jobs and grow the innovation economy? So I think as soon as you transition the conversation from the zero sum game to this kind of more holistic approach of how cities can just work harder for us and work harder for the economy in general, you start to have a richer, more productive discussion about how we can really move forward into the future rather than, you know, how can we kind of fight over this, like, you know, one company moving here versus moving there. And I think it's just a more productive way of looking at it. So in Philadelphia, we're just happy to be in the game. We don't even think about <laughs> zero sum. <laughs> well, no, I think... I, I, don't talk about Philadelphia. <laughs> no, 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 because I think, I think Philadelphia along the way sort of lost its confidence and, and viewed itself as a city that couldn't possibly compete with, with Boston or New York. Just the very process of going through this whole innovation district formation has brought out so many potential you know, partners and allies and community organizations that want to be involved. It's, it's been a terrific surge of energy that we're experiencing right now. And so we're sort of pre where Boston is, but we're in a very good place because I think people are now getting their nerve back and saying, yes, we can go out and we can compete. And at the same time that all of this is going on, what's happened, in, particularly in Center City, but also in University City and in other really sort of you know, forlorn places around the city, those neighborhoods have been revitalizing by themselves. And those, those young people who are doing that are looking for two things, really good jobs, and really good schools to send their kids if they decide to stay in the area. And right now we don't, we don't have the, you know, the, the level of job growth that we need to have, and we certainly have a, a virtually tragic situation with our, our public schools. And so I think we're getting organized around the fact that people like Philadelphia, it's convenient, it has great history, great culture, great restaurants, it has a, a good quality of life play, but it's not economically set up to be as successful as other places like Boston and San Francisco and New York. So what are we going to do about it? And our response is going to be this, this innovation district. Rather than handing out million dollar tax incentives. Exactly. Gotcha. Well, I would, I would just say that innovation by its, almost by its definition, we sort of seem to talk about a new and growth and change. And look, innovation requires talent. And talent, fortunately, our education institutions are pumping out the talent regularly. So it's our obligation in some respects to create those opportunities for that talent to be nurtured right. and to right. in, in effect, effect grow and change and create new ideas. And I think that what we're really talking about is the creation of these physical spaces and, some, and, cre and provision of capital that enables the growth of new things. Now, there is competition. Uh, there is competition because there's only a certain amount of physical space available for these companies to grow into. Uh, so I think what's important is that uh, we see this more as a regional issue as opposed to just the specific locational issue in a particular city. And there are, there are the, 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 you know, there's no question that the, the most successful and most well-capitalized companies will end up in the shiniest, tallest buildings, but there are constantly at a, at a very sort of almost grassroots level, there's always change and, and new companies are forming. And the question is, what do we do with those new companies? Can we create spaces for those new companies to feel comfortable to grow and change? And as they get to a certain maturity, they probably will move on to another uh, location or, or certainly uh, spread out into other locations. But I do think that uh, it's not a zero sum game at all. And I think it's certainly well worth the effort in trying to nurture uh, the growth of new companies. Mm -hmm. gotcha. A quick thought. Um, I think the mantra really is collaborate to compete, um, take stock home. Two very different uh, innovation districts. They actually are coming together and creating new products and markets, uh, new products and services by, by basically brainstorming and identifying where we can create new opportunities together and essentially creating what is called a convergence economy and reducing their overall risk. So collaborate to compete is, is key here. I think they call that coopetition. <laughs> <laughs> is it hashtag coopetition? Coopetition. Right? Co um, last question before you all get to pose your own, so start thinking. Um, so we've, we're talking a lot about cities here and um, 
that is kind of, it seems like where we're all headed, urbanization is a thing globally. Um, but if you're out in some small town, do you just have to move to a city to participate in this? Or how small can an innovation district get? Is rural America just sort of going to be left behind in this whole equation? Well, I, I can offer up Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which everyone's image of Lancaster, Pennsylvania is, you know, the Amish farms and a wonderful rural, you know, um, quality of life out there. In fact, there's a 50,000 person city sitting within Lancaster County, um, Lancaster City, which is where Franklin and Marshall was, where I, I used to work. And what we did is we looked at this very compact, very diverse, very interesting, historically and otherwise, city and said, you know, what's its future going to be? Because it was, it was really struggling. And I won't go through all the details of this, but one of the things that actually was in that city was a massive rail yard that bisected one side from the other. And on one side of that rail yard was a 65-acre Armstrong plan with about 200-plus buildings. And on the other side of that was the train station that went to Philadelphia and to New York. And so we said to ourselves, is there any way to reintegrate the street grid here and sort of knit this little city back together again? Because we thought that would give the promise of all sorts of very interesting economic possibilities and, and you know, housing development, things like that. So we actually demolished, the, and this is a little 2,000-person liberal arts college as developer. We demolished um, the, the, this 65-acre, 200-building site uh, where Armstrong was, through a, a lot of great help from, from then Governor Rendell. Uh, we actually relocated the rail yard to a, a location about two miles up the yard. We you know, basically ripped up the tracks and are now, as they speak, as I speak now, they're reconnecting the street grid. So I, I don't think we should count out those small cities or those rural areas if they're determined and they have a, you know, a vision of what this can be. And the fact is, it's a very, very well-located you know, city. It has uh, a lot of potential. And I think it, its future now looks very different and very possible compared to where it was a, a decade or a decade and a half ago. So I'm, I'm a big believer that these places that are the unlikely you know, ones can, can actually make a go of this as well. And I think if there's a takeaway maybe that, that's sort of very universal, I think, from, from these discussions, is that you know, connections are the sort of engine of the innovation right. economy. Can, you just can't get away from how important connections are. So I'd say for any location, whether it's you know, waterfront or landlocked or urban or rural or big or small, um, I think the, the evaluation that you can make is, um, is probably two things. And then first of all, you know, as Bruce always quotes Dolly Parton uh, is the, the figure out who you are and be it on purpose. Um, it's great. I mean, it's fabulous. And, and uh, we were also discussing the other day the amount of innovation in the agriculture industry. Yeah. And in some of the, the we, we talk a lot at the Venture Cafe Foundation, I'm pointing to Carlos from our team out in the audience here, um, about uh, uh, this non-sector specific approach and also about the fact that it's not all about tech, right? I mean, they're, they're entrepreneurs are also, uh, they're craftspeople, they're artists, the artist studios you have in San Francisco, you know, the Innovation District in Boston is full of artist studios. And, and the artists were the ones that initially built that uh, uh, community and really made it a place that people wanted to be in the first place. So I think if you take this, uh, figure out who you are and be on purpose, right? And then think about um, are connections working or not in your place, wherever that is. Um, whether that's connections, kind of intra connections in the town itself, um, uh, are the, the resources that people need, um, are they connecting to the people that need them to the schools sort of know how to talk to the business community? Um, or if it's beyond, maybe there's a great ecosystem there, but for some reason it's not as well connected to the kind of regional economic infrastructure as it needs to be. Do you need a rail link to a bigger city? Do you need uh, to think about your highway infrastructure? I mean, I don't know, every place is different. Um, but this lens of connection, that was the thing in the Boston Innovation District that let us take things as disparate as how are we going to work with the business community, how are we going to think about housing, how are we going to think about infrastructure. The only thing that really united all those conversations in a, in, a, in a way that allowed us to kind of move forward productively was this lens of connection and how can we use each of these sort of tools to better connect people with each other. And so in our case, what happened was you know, we had a non-sector specific approach to the business community because for us, um, helping companies like Arteic that are growing at the intersection of the creative economy and technology um, 
or at the intersection of uh, e-commerce and health, um, th those you know sectors that don't play nicely within the NAICS codes designations are like those are innovative. I mean, one of the hardest things to do um, uh, working on the innovation district initiative was to make a database of companies in the innovation district and categorize them. It was a nightmare. And my interns, like the poor things, they were like so good. We worked on this like double tagging system. It's so complicated, which is great. I mean, that's that really means that there's companies there that are doing stuff that that uh, doesn't want to be categorized in the traditional sectors. Um, and then with housing, you know, housing is a fundamentally sort of private concept, the way that we look at it in this country. It's like a nuclear family. And, and especially in, in urban housing, you know, you have a, a, you walk through the lobby, you go to your elevator, you go to your door, and you go inside, and that space is yours, and that's it. But what we said was, how can you take something that's as private as housing and look at it through this lens of how can it better connect people with each other. And what we really came up with was, um, yes, smaller units, and people focus a lot on micro units when they talk about these things, but it's not just about the square footage, at least not the way we did it in Boston. It's about how do you take the kind of public connecting functions that a house can um, perform and maybe move those out and do them better in an aggregated way in a different part of the same project. So in our case, it became really about connection spaces, again, at the ground level and in the lobbies um, in conjunction with kind of smaller units so that an entrepreneur could live in one of these uh, units and then not have to rent co-working space elsewhere because they could work and take meetings uh, with investors and they kind of right in the, the base of the, the building where they lived as a part of their, their residential um, uh, kind of package or whatever. Um, so I think that that's the lens of connection. That's probably the most important thing that I would say to, to any place um, uh, to evaluate when you're thinking about building your innovation economy. Gotcha. Sure, I would just say very briefly that uh, look, innovation happens anywhere and everywhere. And so the fundamental issue is how do you uh, uh, grow that innovation? How do you grow a business from that? How do you nurture it? And I think it takes two things. It takes connectivity, and every jurisdiction has to determine how and what that connectivity is or should be, and it takes capital. And uh, to the extent you can bring innovation is, is uh, present, bringing forward the connectivity and the capital should enable the jurisdictions to to create something, at least the beginnings of an innovation district or an innovation garage or something. Because let's face it, around the country there are all kinds of wonderful opportunities for, for, uh, where, or examples where people have grown ideas and they've been able to stay within those particular locales and grow that ideas into many other businesses. And the, and the, and the question has always been, has, how has that locale assisted in the growth of that business? And they're all definitely looking for capital. Um, all right, anybody have a question? Uh, Ma'am. Oh, hello. Oh, please uh, state your name and your affiliation. Uh, Ellen McCarthy, I'm the director of the DC Office of Planning. The, many of the cities that you're talking about, like Boston and San Francisco, here in DC, have access to that talent, partly because we've created attractive cities and places. But what that seems to mean also is then introducing enormous competition for housing and having to deal with very high housing price, <clears throat> prices, which I, I know I had read was a problem with the Innovation District in Boston. So have, have you found successful strategies for dealing with that in your districts? I guess you mentioned Boston, so I can Go jump ahead. in first. I, housing is an absolutely critical piece of this puzzle. It's critical. And um, I think that there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, I think that the, you know, thinking about this idea of the urban lab and was, was the place where we started with housing in Boston. Say, okay, we're going to be building housing here anyways. We have developers that want to do it. What do we want that housing to do? How do we want it to do it things better than it's done in the past? Um, we've made progress and we have these new projects like Factory 63, 315 on A, and uh, Pier 4 on the waterfront that, that are rethinking this collaborative space and, and uh, how can we kind of build density and sustainability um, into these housing projects from the beginning. But, you know, to be honest, I think there's just so much more work to do on this and, and I don't know I don't know what the exact right answer is. I think that there's a lot of experimentation still left to do, and Kofi's nodding. I think he probably has a lot to add with what they're thinking about um, in their development. But I, I'd say that you know one thing that hasn't been cracked very well at all is what happens for kind of multi-generational housing, right? And so one thing I would be really interested in seeing, and I hope somebody is working on some brilliant project somewhere that I don't know about, is 
how do you take this idea of kind of connected shared infrastructure built into residential projects and then how does that translate for family living, right? Like how do, how do I as a 20 something person know that I'll be able to live in the city 10 years from now um, not just from a cost perspective, but actually from the fact that I need housing that's that's conducive for a family um, uh, to be kind of living together. And I uh, I don't I don't know what the the answer is to that. I, I think you're, you've highlighted a really key part of this discussion and something that uh, needs further experimentation and investment. Um, there is a project in Boston that I always call out as an example here, uh, which is an older project uh, called the Piano Factory, the Piano Craft Guild Apartments in the South End. It's a former piano factory that uh, kind of takes up a whole block and right in the middle there's this big beautiful park like a, a private kind of shared um, park and it was artist housing when it was built in the first place and there's these wonderful stories about families that grew up in then, what was then a really rough neighborhood, the South End in Boston, um, uh, be, but they were able to kind of grow their families there and, and um, they had this kind of asset, this shared asset in the middle, this kind of um, uh, park that they could all uh, use together and, uh, and build a community within that one building. So I think, that, I think there's a lot more to do, especially on this multi-generational approach. Um, I guess I would answer just looking at Barcelona, just it's a more mature innovation district. It's been around for a number, of good, over, well over a decade. And, and, you know, I've had this conversation with them about how do you balance this in terms of you have things rising, the prices are increasing, um, as more firms are coming in, what about the housing? What about affordability? And essentially, you know, their answer is, well, we're never done. Right. Right, so there is no end to this. This is about consistently evolving and checking in and getting a sense, what more do we need to add? Is there more affordability that we need to be focusing on? You know, and how do you make that adjustment? How do you pivot in a way that you make sure that you're standing true to your principles? I mean, this is really what they're, this is how they're operating even still today. They're consistently reevaluating how they're doing and where they need to go. So I have, I have two sort of responses, I think. One is sort of specifically with what we're doing. Now, we're fortunate in that we have 800 acres, and in the 800 acres, we're building 12,500 homes. Within the 12,500 12, homes, we have a variety of housing types. Uh, as I said earlier, we have townhomes, we have uh, uh, podium products, we have apartments, and we have high rises. And within some of the homes, we also have uh, what we call multi-generational mm -hmm. uh, type facilities, so uh, people, various ages and maturities can live within the same home. Um, uh, but I think the, the key point is, as part of the, uh, the negotiation with the city and the community, we have 32% of those homes will be affordable. And the key with the city was to ensure that the affordability was over a very wide spectrum. It's not just the, the sort of public housing, no income, very low income uh, uh, for families, but also the workforce families. And so we have, of the 32, as I said, 32% of the homes will be affordable, and it's, again, sprinkled in the, almost exactly the same kinds of homes as the uh, folks who will be living in the market rate homes. And, and I think that's important for any real thinking of development in a, in a fairly significant scale. I, so, so that's how we're dealing with it. And obviously, the people will have the access to all the amenities we're living within the community. Um, but there's no question that housing is a, is a significant issue. I mean, San Francisco is blessed with this wonderful uh, surge in job growth, and with that creates a variety of issues that you're probably experiencing here. Um, but part of that problem, as somebody who used to work in the public sector for many, many years, is the fundamental way we look at the creation uh, and distribution of housing. We think of housing as a local asset. We think of jobs as a local asset. Actually, they're regional. If you think about it, both housing and jobs are regional assets. Unfortunately, the job that's created in San Francisco, uh, uh, the person may be living in another city, or would like to live in San Francisco, and that's what we're trying to deal with, but the city in which they live may have a pretty politically uh, stern policy against the certain kinds of homes. And that happens in the Bay Area, unfortunately, quite a bit. There are some cities that have some of the, the, the highest office rents, uh, have a very low density, let's say, housing policy. Uh, so, and, I, and I, I always sort of go back to how we think about these assets. So one of the reasons we're never done is because we continue to think about them in a less than strategic fashion. 
and we <laughs> tend to think about them. <laughs> well, that wasn't my point, but you know. <laughs> but that's how, it, ultimately, that's the result of what happens if, you, if, if one city has to try to deal with the jobs housing balance, yeah. and another city yeah. says, well, we want the jobs, we don't yeah. want the housing, and another city says, you know, we'll do the housing, and we don't want the, you know, it goes on and on. You will never, in a region, ever get to that balance where everybody yeah. actually wants the jobs and the, and, the, and the tax dollars associated with the jobs. So I would just say that from within our development, we think we have a policy in place that is uh, quite uh, egalitarian in some respects. But even when we're finished and we're hugely successful, this problem will remain. Right, and we shouldn't forget the importance of local schools in that mix as well. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, I, I think of all the the progress we've made in University City in certain neighborhoods, it's been, I think, not entirely, but mostly due to the, um, the creation of some very good accessible neighborhood schools that do a great job and, and provide a context uh, for people wanting to move into that neighborhood and stay in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for a really key question, and I appreciate the real talk on density and neighborhoods opposing housing. It's very important. Um, all right, um, okay. Um, in the middle there? Good morning, my name is Catherine Buell and I'm the Executive Director for St. Elizabeth's East. Um, and unfortunately, the East Campus has been wrapped up in the um, controversy about the West Campus and the slow movement for the DHS consolidation, but we are building an innovation hub on the East Campus, we're very excited about it. Um, we've identified corporate partners, we've identified universities who are interested in coming over. We're actually opening a demonstration center this summer that's very um, similar to the District Hall. But my question is, um, what kinds of partners have you attracted that are more philanthropic partners out, mm. or outside of the typical partnerships that governments and other innovation hubs look to build that have helped you build these innovation hubs where you're at? Good question. <laughs> Who wants it? I don't have any yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. In, in my experience, you know, particularly in, in, in Philadelphia, um, they're, they're risk averse, and so they want to see, they want to see progress. Um, in fact, everyone's risk averse except for, in 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 the, in the case of the universities, you know, they sort of went first. They staked out some of the early initiatives, um, and then gradually, I think, with with progress and and the confidence that created, we saw the foundations wanting to come in. We saw that the private sector become engaged. But I, I think that's an issue of risk, and I, I don't think that you know, the, the risk profile of foundations is, is all that high. And you would expect actually the opposite. Now, I know in Detroit, that's probably a very different story. Mm -hmm. But I, I can tell you in Philadelphia that we have incredible philanthropic uh, resources and, and support. But it generally, in, in my view, hasn't been there sort of at first. It, it, it waits till you sort out the initial set of issues. And then they can come in and be extremely helpful and, and collaborative um, as you go along. And I think that's, that's very well said. Very politically said, I might ask too. Yeah. <laughs> Very well said. But there's no question that uh, uh, you would think that uh, the philanthropic organizations, with all the good work that they do in a variety of other contexts, would uh, see that the opportunities to create jobs and, and grow jobs and generate better qualities of life, if you will, for, for the population would be in um, investing perhaps in some of these uh, opportunities uh, in these innovation districts and some urban redevelopment type projects. But that absolutely doesn't happen very, very regularly. Uh, I know that Detroit certainly, it's, it's certainly, I think, uh, a wonderful opportunity, uh, uh, option there. But I also think Cleveland has done some very interesting things. Some of the Cleveland Foundation has done some very interesting things. But uh, we are still looking to see if we can uh, explain to the philanthropic organizations in the Bay Area what a wonderful opportunity it would be to, to uh, invest in, in what we're doing. I think in, in our experience with the Venture Cafe Foundation, um, we, we are a nonprofit and we run um, District Hall. And I, uh, we, don't, you know, we don't have any um, uh, kind of solidified partnerships yet. But I mean, we're, we're new at everything we do. So you know, te again, check back in a year. Um, but I, I think that um, what we're finding in, in some of the other cities that we're doing work in, uh, like St. Louis, um, opening up some conversations in Miami, 
um, and certainly Detroit, is that there can be a there can be a symbiotic relationship between this sort of real estate capital component and then a, a philanthropic capital component that in our case has been more program based. Um, so uh, really building programs around uh, kind of K through eight integration into the innovation economy at a younger age um, and, and other things that you know we really haven't built yet but we've been having kind of initial discussions about on the, the kind of uh, storytelling component around innovation. How do we get the word out locally or, or nationally about something that's going on in a place um, in a way that makes people feel that they can connect to it. And so I think that, that in our experience it's been, I'm again looking at Carlos, I, I think it's been a, a um, a a com combination approach between the sort of real estate financing coming from uh, real estate partners and and um, uh, and kind of government partnerships and things like that, and then the philanthropic funding coming in on a more uh, program-based approach. Not to say that I think um, you know that couldn't be rethought. I, I think that the, all of these are are um, a more iterative approach is probably uh, always a, a really good way to go when you're talking about innovation. Yeah, district has some unique challenges when it comes to philanthropy, just lacking any native industries besides the federal government. So Catherine has her work cut out for her. Um, we have to take a last question because there's such good questions. Um, so I'm looking at the, in the back there. Uh, no, you, yeah. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Big black glasses, cool. Hi, my name is Edwin Gonzalez. I'm from the Small Business Administration. Um, you guys spoke a lot about uh, starting innovation districts at what is considered dilapidated areas or economically strapped areas. Do you think that these the development of these innovation districts could be misconstrued as another form of gentrification? Say that one for last. Well, I, I, I will, I will, I, oh, you, I mean, please, go I ahead. I mean, I think um, we're really looking at these as building on unique ac economic assets, right? It just happens to be that in some of these cases there is available land. <laughs> Um, with lower land rents that actually make this a possibility in one place. But in, in, real, in other cases, right, there are three other, there's two other models. The other is the Anchor Plus. It's really about building on those existing economic assets. And then as much as possible, infusing the inclusion component in right from the beginning. Um, I have to say, frankly, that in talking with district leaders in the United States, I have been really impressed by the thoughtfulness about the level of inclusion when thinking about growing up you know, these, um, these districts and having strong economies and strong clusters. How do you do that hand in glove with housing and schools? And, and, I, and as someone that has been looking and working on both sides of the Atlantic, frankly, I must confess, confess aside from 22 at, um, that the United States and that these districts are being more thoughtful here about these very issues. So I think <clears throat> the other side of the Atlantic needs to learn mm -hmm. from these leaders here on this subject. Well, I will just quickly say that the, the, I have mentioned the affordable housing component within our, our um, uh, communities. And obviously there are preferences for those who are adjacent, immediately adjacent to the community uh, to, 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 to come into these new developments. But we also have a fairly significant community benefits program uh, that goes beyond the, the housing. A community our community benefits program also provides for down payment assistance programs. And, and as I mentioned before, we provide uh, funding and opportunities for hiring for folks from di directly adjacent to the, to the community. We have a citywide program and we have one more focused on the, as we call it, District 10, the Bayview Hunters Point area. Uh, we have funds set aside for health and wellness programs. We have funds set aside for uh, education augmentation that we are uh, working with the community to best understand is are we better off investing in the existing school system that's adjacent in the community or are we better off uh, building a newest uh, uh, campus of some kind within the district. As you can see, it's a collaborative process. Not everybody in the community is an agreement as to how best to uh, spend the funds. But so we, almost on a weekly basis, uh, many of the folks on my team uh, interact with the community so that we can understand best how to, uh, uh, frankly, bring them up with us mm -hmm. and, frankly, incorporate their needs into our development. Right, and I, th I think your, your question is so important. I think one of the, the great uh, benefits of this Promise Zone designation, it, it's going to allow all of us together to actually squarely address those issues and to do it in a collaborative framework over 
a very long period of time with very community um, and, and invested, you know, community partners and universities and hospitals and because this this is this has really been the Achilles heel of a lot of these developments is what yeah. you're talking about and yeah. hopefully the promise zone gives us a framework to to go with that together. Yeah, I think I mean you're you're hearing pretty similar stuff from the panel. I, I don't think gentrification is a foregone conclusion. I certainly don't think it should be a foregone conclusion in these projects. Um, it's for me this always comes back to the fact that we have to remember like cities are for people, right? That cities are for people. Cities aren't for companies or for patents or for apps. They're for people. And so we can't um, go into this saying, okay, we're going to make a neighborhood that's really great for X type of company. Because if we do that, we're doing it wrong, right? If we do that, we're doing our real estate a disservice, we're doing our streetscape a disservice, we're doing our cities a disservice, we're doing our children a disservice, if we, if we look at it that way. Um, so, you know, I have had conversations with people that talk about this and say, um, you know, well, this is just gentrification, this is just how this works. Um, I don't think that's really a good enough answer. I, I think that you know the fact that we're having a discussion at the beginning of this, as you know, this is sort of coagulating into a sort of movement. Um, as Julie said, if we keep talking about this from the beginning, I think we have a much better chance of actually building inclusive neighborhoods for the future. Um, and you know, just to give one more example, I keep talking about this idea of the ground floor as really important. You know, I think. You know, in Boston, you can walk through the city and, and in, in any given neighborhood, you might um, be able to, there might be sort of innovation assets around you, right? That, but a lot of times they're up on the 14th floor and you have to go through an elevator and get a name tag and go through a security guard and go upstairs. And, and you might know that they're there if you know somebody and they bring you with them. Um, but walking on the street, you would never know it's anything but a sort of law firm in an anonymous law, uh, office building. Um, I think that you know, certainly what District Hall tries to do differently is that we're on the street level. The building is a weird shape. It makes you ask a question when you walk by, like, what the heck is that thing? And there's a restaurant inside and a coffee shop and, and all of these really clear signals. Come inside, come participate in this. So even if you've never heard the word innovation before in your life, you can walk into the building and grab a coffee and understand what's going on around you because it, it, we're trying to tell stories about what's happening and how you can connect and be a part of it. Um, and, and so I think that's a fundamental reshaping in the way that we're thinking about inclusiveness in a physical way, in physical real estate. I don't think it's the end of the conversation. I don't like, good job, we built District Hall, now we're done. I mean, I think we have a lot to learn and, and, and really to incorporate that type of thinking in the future. But what kind of message are we sending about permeability, about access as we're building these neighborhoods or, um, or kind of transforming them in physical ways uh, that, that might have this kind of economic implication that in the future that may be different? All right, thank you all. I'm so sorry we have to wrap up. So many more questions. Um, I am now going to thank the panel, and we're all going to leave. Um, and before, though, we do that, um, I'm going to introduce your next act, which is Bruce again, um, and the amazing mayor of Chattanooga, Andy Burke. Um, do we leave before you guys come up? OK. OK. So um, give me a mic. Who, uh, thank you.